MBK 2 32 Krishna returns to Dwaraka Chapter 32 Krishna returns to Dwaraka Yudhishthira began ruling the earth as lord of the Kaurus. Surrounded by his brothers, he resembled Indra seated in Amaravadiya Yudhishthira had arranged that Dhritarashtra continuous chief administrator of Hastinapura. The blind king, attended by Sanjaya and Uyotsu, gave orders which even the Pandavas followed out of deference Draupadi. Subhadra and the other ladies treated Dhritarashtra and Gondhori as father and mother. Even Kunti behaved toward Gondhori as one would act toward a senior Kripa had returned to the city and become Dhritarashtra's trusted counselor, and Vyasadeva and other rishis also advised him Yudhishthira, however, still felt a deep sense of guilt and shame. Seeing the thousands of bereaved women and children in the city, he was consumed by sorrow Krishna, who at Yudhishthira's request had agreed to live in Hastinapura for some time, spoke to the mourning king. Do not indulge your grief, O best of men, for by so doing you will increase the grief of your people and even give pain to your departed relatives. You should celebrate and perform sacrifices. Give joy to your subjects. Make profuse offerings to your forefathers and distribute charity to the Brahmins. Thus any trace of sin caused by the war will be washed off. Perform the Ashvamedha sacrifice, O king, and renounce this useless grief, sighing, Yudhishthira replied, O Govinda, I know you are fond of me. You have always favored me and my brothers. O John Ordna, speak again of eternal spiritual truths, for my mind that is still heavy. Reassured by your words, which I am by like nectar, I will become enthused to carry out my duties, Krishna was always inclined to satisfy Yudhishthira's desires. He knew that the Pandava monarch had no other refuge. Although Krishna wanted to return to Dwaraka to see his relatives, he had acceded to Yudhishthira's repeated pleas that he stay in Hastinapura. Now, seeing his dejection, Krishna spoke once more to assuage his sorrow. O foremost of Bharata's race, you must now contend with the most powerful enemy of all, your mind. Your only weapon in this battle is knowledge, and you have no army to assist you. O king, you already know everything. You know that all beings are undying, spiritual entities, that this material world is nothing more than a temporary illusion, and that the primary aim of life is to seek spiritual emancipation. Stand firm on this knowledge, O Yudhishthira, and do your duty. Krishna explained how one desiring liberation must become free from attachment and aversion to material objects, which included the material body and all its designations Yudhishthira's lamentation was based on seeing only the external situation. He was grieving for matter without seeing spirit. All those who had been killed were still existing in new bodies. Those who were grieving for them would also soon die, forgetting their present sorrow. The prime duty of every man is to realize his true identity as an eternal part of the Supreme. That realization would bring complete freedom from the material misery caused by ignorance. By doing your material duties only for God's pleasure will you gain this realization, O King, for such actions are on the spiritual platform and will soon raise you to spiritual consciousness. Throw off your ignorance and do what must be done. Prepare for the sacrifice, please the gods and Vishnu satisfy the Brahmins, and rule this world with justice and compassion, solaced, and instructed by Domya and other rishis, Yudhishthira gradually gave up his anguish. He thanked Krishna, who then asked if he may go to Indraprastha with Arjuna. The two friends wanted to spend some time together in that beautiful city, especially in the celestial Mahasabha Yudhishthira gave his permission and soon they were traveling in Krishna's chariot, moving swiftly along the broad highway that went from Hastinapura toward the north Arjuna and Krishna spent weeks at Indraprastha. Upon their arrival they were greeted by thousands of overjoyed citizens Arjuna and Krishna then retired to the Mahasabha and also spent time together in the delightful, wooded regions surrounding the city. They spoke together about the many battles that had been fought in which the Pandavas had won. Krishna could see that Arjuna too was grieving for the loss of his sons and friends and thus he consoled him. After some weeks, Krishna again wanted to return to Dwaraka and he asked Arjuna to secure Yudhishthira's permission. You should know that I am unable to do anything which may displease your brother. My life, wealth and followers are at his disposal. But I think I should return to see my aging father Vasudeva and my other relatives. The earth with her belt of seas and mountains, mines, and forests has come under Yudhishthira's sway. I have spoken words of reason and wisdom to comfort him. 
he is now determined to do his duty. Therefore, I think it is time for me to go. Let us approach Yudhishthira together and seek his approval. Arjuna's heart sank at the thought of Krishna's departure, but he knew it was time Krishna had not seen his relatives since the war. They would surely be grieving for Abhimanyu and would be missing Krishna himself. Reluctantly, Arjuna assented to Krishna's request. Early the next day, they made their way back to Hastinapura. As they traveled Arjuna said, Dear Madhava, I have come to know your true identity from your profound instructions delivered on the first day of the war, but, my lord, I find it difficult to recall those instructions. Indeed, my mind is confused now that you are about to leave us. Please, if you are agreeable, repeat that knowledge to me. Krishna smiled affectionately, surely you are fickle-minded, O son of Pandu. Those truths I spoke were confidential and unknown even to the gods. I am not pleased that you have forgotten them, and I do not think I can repeat them now. But I will recite an ancient history on the same subject. Focus your mind and try to understand, O poor thought, for this knowledge will free you from material bondage, as Dorka drove the chariot to Hastinapura, Krishna narrated the history. Lost in his love for Krishna, Arjuna was captivated by his eloquent speech. The chariot moved swiftly along the smooth road, passing through various villages and alongside fields full of crops or grazing cattle. When the day's journey was almost over, Krishna concluded his instructions and said, If you have any love for me, O scion of Karu, you will lead your life according to these instructions. Always remember your actual identity as soul and remain fixed in rendering service to the Supreme Soul. In that way, you will never fall into illusion again, Arjuna replied that as far as he was concerned, Krishna was the Supreme Soul. Remembrance of him was all that was required to achieve perfection in life. I am convinced of your glories, O Govinda. Indeed, I could not reach the end of your glories if I were to recite them continuously with a thousand mouths and for a thousand years. You are the one Lord of all creatures, known variously only due to the various perceptions of different men. Everything that we, the Pandavas, have achieved is simply due to your favor. Krishna embraced Arjuna, who assured him that he would gain Yudhishthira's permission for his departure. Although my heart is breaking at the thought of you leaving, I understand that you must return to your family. We have already been favored by your long presence here. The chariot entered Hastinapura, passing throngs of cheering citizens who rushed to the roadside to watch it go by Arjuna and Krishna smiled at the people and received their worship by offering them blessings. They soon reached the royal palace and went quickly before Yudhishthira, bowing at his feet and greeting him with affection. They then offered their obeisances to Dhritarashtra and Gondhori, who occupied thrones close to Yudhishthira's. When the formal greetings were over, Arjuna and Krishna sat before Yudhishthira, being fanned by maidservants with chamara whisks. Seeing them both looking up at him, Yudhishthira said, It appears you have something on your minds. Speak it out, O heroes. Whatever you desire, I will satisfy it. Do not hesitate to reveal your minds, Arjuna, who had expected his brother to say just that, smiled. The lord of the Vrishnis and Yadus, Keshava wishes to see his father and other relatives in Warakot. O king, if you think it proper, then please let him go. Grant him permission to repair to his own city, Yudhishthira and his brothers gazed at Krishna, who had been with them now for months. As soon as he had heard of their coming out of exile, he had left Warakot to be with them, guiding them back toward their former positions as rulers of the world. All the brothers knew that without Krishna they could not possibly have succeeded. Now his work was done Duryodhan and his army of invincible warriors had been overcome. The Pandavas were now the undisputed monarchs, their position better now than before their exile. Both Hastinapura and Indraprastha, the two great capitals of the earth, were now under their command. But the Pandavas cared little for power and opulence. For them, Krishna's presence and love was more valuable than rulership of the earth Yudhishthira's acceptance of the throne, and even his declaring war against the Kauravas, had been due ultimately to his understanding that it was Krishna's desire. Hearing that he now desired to return to Dwarakat, Yudhishthira said, O Lotus Eyed One, O Madhava, I will allow you to go. Go and see my maternal uncle and the goddess Devaki. You have been away for a long time. Offer them my deepest respects, and also Balorama, who is ever worthy of the world's worship. Think of us daily, 
and if it pleases you, return when we perform the Ashvamedha. Everything we possess is simply due to your favor, Yudhishthira immediately dispatched swift messengers to Dwaraka to inform the citizens of Krishna's impending arrival. He also ordered that Krishna be given gems and gold in large amounts. Graciously accepting the gifts, Krishna said, O mighty armed one, you are the lord of the earth. Whatever I possess is yours and you may do with it as you wish. I will go now, but I will surely return to see your sacrifice. Krishna decided to leave for Dwaraka early the next morning. He rose from his seat like the sun rising above the eastern hills and left the assembly hall with Arjuna and Satyaki at his side. Yudhishthira and the other Pandavas followed him as he mounted his chariot, going with his two friends to Arjuna's palace for the night. After sunrise Krishna prepared to leave. Mounting his jeweled chariot, he proceeded to Yudhishthira's palace to say his final farewells. Hearing that he was about to depart, Kunti and the other Karu ladies came out to see him. The noble ladies, resplendent in silk, stood with tears in their eyes, mentally offering their obeisances at Krishna's feet again and again. Remembering the many times that Krishna had protected her and her sons, Kunti stood by the side of his chariot with folded palms and offered prayers. O oh Krishna, you are the original personality, unaffected by anything in this material world. You exist within and without, yet you are invisible to all. Foolish men fail to recognize your identity as the super soul in all beings, for you cannot be known by the material senses. Only those who are free from lust and avarice can approach and know you, for otherwise you remain covered by your own illusory energy. Yet you reciprocate with those who come to you in love, acting from within their hearts to free them from illusion, standing outside the great royal palace, which towered above her like a white mountain, Kunti praised Krishna for some time. She described the many occasions that she and her sons had been in danger and how Krishna had saved them. Her voice trembled with a sublime joy. O Govinda, I wish that all those calamities would happen again and again so that we could see you again and again, for seeing you means that we will no longer see repeated birth and death. During her son's exile, Kunti had devoted herself to fasts and asceticism. She was a self-realized soul and understood that the ultimate aim of life was to achieve freedom from rebirth in the material world. Realizing that her many difficulties in life had forced her to meditate on Krishna, she felt that those difficulties had been a great blessing. For she had come to know Krishna as the final goal of all spiritual practices Kunti had cultivated detachment from matter and prayed that Krishna would sever her last attachments to the world in the form of her feelings of affection for her sons and other relatives Kunti knew that in order to achieve complete liberation, she had to see all living beings, including her own family, as eternal spirit souls. One in true knowledge sees and loves all creatures equally, knowing them to be parts of the Supreme. Bodily designations are temporary and, ultimately, meaningless. After describing Krishna's transcendental qualities, Kunti concluded her prayers with a heartfelt plea. O Lord of Madhu, as the gangs forever flows to the sea without hindrance, let my attraction be constantly drawn to you without being diverted to anyone else. You are my and my son's only shelter. How are you leaving us today, even though we are completely dependent on you and have no one else to protect us, especially now that so many kings are at enmity with us? Kunti knew that although the Pandavas had conquered their enemies, they would soon have to contend with the sons and followers of the kings they had killed. Those kings had only brought some of their forces to fight at Kurukshetra, leaving sons or brothers to rule in their absence. Thus there were still many rulers around the world who commanded armies and who would likely be antagonistic to the Pandavas. With her gaze fixed on Krishna's face, she added, as the name and fame of a particular body is finished with the disappearance of the living spirit, similarly, if you do not look upon us, all our fame and activities will end at once. O oh Krishna, you possess all mystic powers, and you are the preceptor of the entire universe. You are the Almighty God, and I offer you my respectful obeisances." Krishna held up his hand, decorated with jewels and red sandalwood paste, in blessing as Kunti ended her prayers, enchanting all who saw him with his beauty and grace. He told Kunti that just as she was always thinking of him, he never forgot her or her sons. Then it was time for Krishna to leave Satyaki mounted the chariot, and the royal escort Yudhishthira had arranged led him from the city Yudhishthira and his brothers climbed up on Krishna's chariot and embraced him. The palace ladies praised Krishna from the balconies, showering him with flowers. 
The streets were lined with citizens longing for one final sight of Krishna. After the Pandavas had said their farewells and dismounted, Doraka commanded Krishna's celestial horses and his chariot moved off. The Pandavas stood gazing after the chariot as it went along the red stone road leading from the city. When it was out of sight, they slowly and silently made their way back into the palace when Krishna was alone on his chariot, Dora courage on the horses. The chariot quickly reached the speed of the wind. Passing lakes, rivers, forests and hills, as well as towns and hamlets, it finally arrived in Warakot. As he approached the city, Krishna blew a blast on his conch shell. The guards heard the sound and threw open the city gates with shouts of joy. They announced Krishna's imminent arrival and the citizens ran out of the city. Seeing Krishna returning after so long, they felt as if they had woken from a long sleep. They offered him cows, golden gems, and cheered and beat drums as he passed. Tall flags lined the roofs of mansions, and the ground was strewn with flower petals. As Krishna's chariot moved slowly along the road, the citizens waved branches of palm, banana and mango trees. In every doorway stood golden water pits, baskets of fruit, sugar cane, pots of milk, and other auspicious articles. Incense billowed from every house and hundreds of thousands of candles burned. As he moved toward his father's palace, Krishna saw the opulence of his city, the orchards and flower gardens, the beautiful lakes teeming with swans and thick with red and blue lotuses. Golden archways studded with precious stones stood at every crossroad, and white mansions lined the roads. Numerous Brahmins worship Krishna, and Krishna heard them praising him as he passed. In voices suffused with ecstasy they said, O Almighty One, you are worshipable by even the gods and are the ultimate goal of life for all transcendentalists. You are our protector, guide and worshipable Lord. By good fortune have we seen you again, for you rarely visit even the denizens of heaven. The Brahmins prayed that Krishna not leave Dwaraka again, saying that each day he was absent felt like thousands of years Krishna received their prayers and worship by glancing at them affectionately. As the chariot moved forward, a number of powerful men went ahead to clear the road. Followed by a procession of elephants, chariots and walking citizens, Krishna's chariot gradually made its way through the dense crowds and arrived at Vasudeva's palace. In the courtyard he saw colorfully dressed dancers and actors expertly enacting his pastimes with grace, while singers and poets glorified him to musical instruments. Pleased, Krishna dismounted from his chariot and met the leading citizens. According to their status he bowed before them, embraced them, or offered them his blessings. He exchanged greetings, shook hands, and offered benedictions to hundreds of citizens. Then he entered his father's house. Devaki was the first to greet Krishna as he came into the house. After he had placed his head at her feet, she embraced him and sat him upon her lap, stroking his head and offering him her blessings. Krishna then greeted all the senior palace ladies, seeing them as mothers, and then went before Vasudeva. After he had touched his father's feet and received his embrace, Krishna sat by his side and told him the news from Hastinapura Vasudeva had not heard much about the war, and he asked Krishna to tell him everything that had happened since his departure. Surrounded by other Vrishni elders, Vasudeva listened to Krishna's narration. Krishna deliberately avoided telling his father about Abhimanyu's death. When Krishna stopped speaking, Subhadra, present by her father's side, asked, Why? O oh Krishna, have you not told your father about my son's death after saying this? She dropped to the palace floor in a swoon. When Vasudeva heard her words, he also fell, overcome by grief. Krishna quickly took them both up and consulted them. My dear father, dearest sister, how could I speak that which would only give you sorrow? You should know that the heroic Abhimanyu died in the thick of battle. While contending with numerous invincible fighters, never once showing his back, he finally gave up his life. Only due to the inevitable influence of time did the mighty hero fall in battle. None could have slain him. He has now reached regions of undying happiness. Cast off your burning grief and we will make his funeral offerings. After going to a sanctified spot in the palace compound, Krishna, along with Balo Rama and aided by the Brahmins, personally performed Abhimanyu Shraddha ceremony. On behalf of his departed nephew he gave charity to millions of Brahmins. He distributed heaps of gold and gems, along with hundreds of thousands of cows. The ceremony was attended by all the leading Vrishnas, headed by their king, Ugrasena, and all of Krishna's thousands of sons and other relatives. After the ceremony, 
Krishna retired to his personal quarters in Rukmini's palace, and the citizens of Dwaraka returned home feeling both joy and sorrow.